Good morning, and welcome to our online worship service. As you probably know, uh, we are in what they're calling the yellow time, which means that we're still restricted to 25 people or less in any single room. But we are trying to maintain the safest possible environment for you, so we will not be starting up just yet. When we do, though, we will have put a number of safety procedures in place so that uh, there is no risk to you when you come back to church. With that, I'm going to ask you to bow with me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to fellowship together in your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you have provided this opportunity for us. And we pray, Father, that you would bless us today through your word and through the music that is shared with us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Welcome back, and I ask you to bow with me as we pray for the message. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your spirit is our comforter and our teacher, and it is he who makes your word real, makes it known to us, gives us understanding. And we pray, Father, that as we gather in our homes, you would minister to us through your spirit so that we may hear what you would have us to hear in this message today. In Jesus' name, amen. As Peter begins his first epistle, his focus was on this salvation that is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ. In that context, he spoke of the elements of this salvation, the genuineness of this salvation, and the desire of the prophets and angels to better understand this salvation. The purpose of these sections was to provide us with an understanding of the wonders of this salvation. And now Peter begins a series of exhortations or challenges that are based on the information that he has already given to us. And this takes us from the realm of knowledge to the realm of wisdom. This involves the life application of knowledge, learning to live what we have learned. It is here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 21, that he addresses two essential aspects of Christian living, hope and fear in the sense of reverence. I'm going to be reading 1 Peter 1, 13 through 21. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, 
Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believed in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. We're going to look at the first part of this first exhortation. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, therefore is like a signpost. It is warning us to take note of what is next. The old saying is, when you see the word therefore, always look to see what it is there for. And in this particular case, it is there to call us to pay attention to a command. Gird up your loins is a phrase or idiom that's common to Judaism and is based on their practice of wearing long robes as their primary garment. It is the word anazunomi, and it describes lifting up the rear and front borders of that garment so that you can secure it with the rope or band around your waist in order to run, to work strenuously, or to do battle. This allows us to move unimpeded, and it also provides a certain protection for the loins. This is specifically a command, and would be better translated, you be girding up the loins of your mind. As such, it's the metaphorical use of the word, and applied directly to the mind. And it has the sense of getting one's mind ready for action. And one might state it like this, make up your minds decisively. Being sober is the word nafo, meaning to be of a sound mind or self-controlled rather than infatuated or enamored by the things of this world. Herein, Peter is speaking about a state of being resulting from girding up the loins of the mind. The phrase, rest your hope, is a command based on the Greek word elpizo. This word means to hope, to expect with desire, or to look forward with confidence. Now, the word rest is inserted into the text. It's not in the original Greek, but it helps us to bridge that gap between a Greek expression and an English concept. When we say hope, in most cases, we mean to want something to be. I hope it doesn't rain. But it can also mean expect something to be. An example would be our expectation of the rapture. In the Greek mind, hope means to expect, and that's why Peter adds the word teleos, or fully. Now this word means wholly, completely, or entirely without reservation. Hope completely, without reservation. Hope entirely, without reservation. And this takes us back to Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 25, as Paul explains the future context of hope. And by the way, when we say, I hope it doesn't rain, that is a present sense. When we look at hope in the Greek sense, we're looking at what Paul is expressing here, Romans 8, 22. 
For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. For we were saved in hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope? for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Therein is that thought to hope expectantly and entirely. And Peter also intends us to see that this hope, although it is to be depended upon completely, is already ours. He uses the word brought, which is the Greek word pharaoh. It means to bring, to carry, to bear. But the verb is a present passive participle. Present means ongoing. Passive means it's being done to us rather than we're doing it. And with the participle, that's that I-N-G word. And it would be better translated being brought and refers to the grace that we have from the moment we believe, and continue to receive in Christ. And with all that in mind, this first statement would be better read in this manner. Therefore, be girding up the loins of your mind, being sober-minded. Be hoping entirely on the grace being brought to you. The grammar here suggests that the grace is being brought to us. And because it's a participle, what that means is this hope is present with us. This hope is continuing to be brought to us. And this hope will continually to be brought in the future. We read in 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 and 13, where he, by the way, is applying this principle. Beloved. Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, in order that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now, in this particular case, we understand the revelation of Christ's glory in the context of the perusia. Now, this is, by definition, the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation. In other words, hope in what will surely be brings joy in present sorrows. My absolute expectation in the second coming of Christ gives me strength and encourages me in the here and the now. Peter then tells us in 1 Peter 1.14 that we're to do so as obedient children. Now, there's a sense to this that we may not recognize in the English. Now, obedience is the word hupa kae, which we saw in 1 Peter 1.12 in Peter's introduction to the epistle. And again, hupa kae means to hear and believe, and that's the way it's used here in James 1.22, where we read, but be you doers of word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Be doers of the word, not hearers who do not do. And that is our encouragement. Peter then builds on that idea. And he's providing a contrast which explains what obedience is here in 1 Peter 1.14. As obedient children not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. This is the old. But as he who is called you is holy, you also be holy in conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now we've seen this sense before. Paul uses it a great deal in the imagery of put off the old and put on the new. And Peter defines the old as conforming yourselves to the old lusts, the former lusts, passions, and desires. This is the driving force in the old man that comes from the old nature. Conforming 
is the Greek word suskematizo. It is a complex word. Sus gives us the together idea. Schemato is the idea of a scheme or a framework. And so it means to form or to mold one's behavior in accordance with a particular pattern or set of standards. And Peter is referring to the old way, the old life, before Christ begot us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The old and the new. Paul speaks of this as well in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, and we see this parallel of thought continue with Peter and Paul. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we see a parallel here before, between the former lust that Peter refers to that we had done in ignorance and this world of sin. Both apostles are speaking specifically of the old way of life. And we are not to be conformed to that. We're not to allow ourselves to be shoved into that mold. And again, we see another parallel, as Paul urges us here, to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is a call to action. This is about implementing our Christianity. And in 1 Peter 1.15, we're exhorted, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy for I am holy. Now, Romans was written about six or seven years before 1 Peter. But it's interesting that these two men of God have this same thought, because God does not change his mind. One prophet or another may word it slightly differently, but the thought comes through again and again, because this is God's will for us. The word holy that is used here is the Greek word hagios, and it's translated generally as set apart, sacred, sanctified, or consecrated. But the root meaning, the core sense of this word is perfect, pure, without blemish. And in that sense specifically, it speaks of the character nature or the essence of God. And this is in the strictest sense because only God is holy. Only God is truly holy. In a secondary sense, this word can be applied to anything that is of God. For example, the name of God is holy. The throne of God is holy. Metaphorically, When it is brought into the human realm, it means morally pure, upright, blameless in heart and life, virtuous. And this is where we bring these two thoughts together in this commandment, be holy for I am holy. We are to be holy. We are to implement the holiness that has been given to us by grace in our lives because, specifically, God is holy. He is the standard to which we are to aspire. His holiness is the life to which he has called us. And having become one with Christ by grace through faith, we receive our or are attributed holiness by God's grace. The phrase, you also be holy in all your conduct, refers to actually making what we have received by grace, what we profess to believe by faith, 
a reality in our daily lives. This is living out Christianity. And so this is our admonition. We cannot be holy in and of ourselves. We must be redeemed. But even as the redeemed, we are still reliant upon the power and the help of God to be able to bring that holiness into our lives as an expression of what he has brought into our hearts. Going back to Romans 12, chapter 12, verse 2 again, we're to prove, which means demonstrate, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Look at these two thoughts together. Peter says, be holy in all your conduct. Paul says, demonstrate what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here is that second witness, as it were. Be holy rather than living according to the former less that we're part of that life of ignorance before Christ. We're saved by grace. We are to live by grace. And we shall be perfected by grace at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. I say by grace because as reflected in the words of R.C.H. Lansky, it is all a work of God. The hand that points us to holiness is the hand that extends its grace to us to make us holy. By pointing us upward, it lifts us upward. This is God's grace in our life, beginning to end, from the moment of salvation, through this life, into our perfection at the resurrection, ultimately to the complete fulfillment of God's purpose for us at the final revelation of Jesus Christ. And as I think about the hope that we have in Christ our Lord, I'm reminded of an old hymn, The Solid Rock. It was penned by Edward Moti in 1834. It was based on Psalm 125, verse 1, where David writes, Those who trust in the Lord are Lark Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abide forever. I want to close with the first and last verse of this hymn, and then just a word of explanation as to why he wrote this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is is sinking sand. Edward Moat was born into an unbelieving family. His parents owned a pub on a back street in England, and he was exposed to most of the ungodly behavior that was common in that particular day. But then, through the years, he came to Christ. Not only did he come to Christ, but he, began, he became a preacher of the gospel. And that transition, that change in his circumstance or his life, from what he was to what he became, is the basis for this hymn. Now I ask, are we hoping completely, wholly, entirely on the grace of God in this moment in our lives, in this world, until he takes us home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for the way you have provided for us, not only in cleansing us from sin and giving us this new life in Christ, but also, Father, in strengthening us and enabling us to live in a manner that is pleasing to you. 
and to provide an example of Christ to those around us in this world. Help us, Father, in our day-to-day lives to demonstrate the good and perfect will of God as we interact with others around us so that they may see his holiness. In Jesus' name, amen.